Well, I think uh, musicians understand and know better than most, really, about the discipline needed in order to develop, mature, and get better and better in artistic expression. I hope, as a result of your weeks here at Chehi, at the conclusion, you are a better musician and hopefully as well a better person. And that changing for the better is not at all self-seeking or self-glorifying, but rather to be expected. And in fact, a worthy aspiration in the interest of excellence in any endeavor in your life. I think this is the focus of scripture in passages like this one that we give attention to in a concentrated way this morning as we return to this very important letter penned by the Apostle Paul that we call 1 Thessalonians. We come now to chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. So let's read those together just now. Finally then, brothers and sisters, we request and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received instructions from us as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel even more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God and that no one violate the rights and take advantage of his brother or sister in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you previously and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in sanctification. Therefore, the one who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Yes, Lord, we do ask that the Holy Spirit given to us would be our teacher, our guide in this really important text for today. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. This actually is such an important Bible teaching passage for us that we could easily give it three or four sessions. But we simply don't have that luxury. So we'll have to give it only a one go this morning. By giving attention to what the Apostle says here, I think his concept is about God's will and God's calling. Many times I have people in my role both as a, a teacher of biblical studies at a Christian seminary and as a pastor of a church, people, and especially Christian teenagers and university students, say to me, I just want to know God's will for me. If I know the will of God, then I can just choose to obey it and follow it or not. I just want to know. Well, if that's the question you've had, here you go. As the passage states it as clear as day. Do you see it with me there in verse 3? For this is the will of God, your sanctification. 
One thing you can be absolutely certain is God's will. He wants you to be engaged in a process in the scripture called sanctification. The New Testament idea of sanctification comes from the word hagiosmos, which literally means holiness, hagiosmos, to be set apart, to live differently, to represent God, set apart from the norm. It is astounding because it stems from the Old Testament Levitical code, the directive in Leviticus chapter 11, verses 40 to 44 and 45, in which God sets the standard, saying to me, to you, be ye holy, because I am holy. <laughs> Quite a lofty aspiration, isn't it? But this is the people of God set apart for his purpose from the inception of this strange group called the Israelites. Be ye holy because I am holy. Hagiosmos. In English, in the New Testament, it's the idea of sanctification. And that means it's in a form, actually, in the Greek text that suggests a process. Thus, we could say moving toward holiness. And I think one of the best ways of putting it in terms that we understand in modern and postmodern life today is simply changing for the better. Not just change, because change could be in a backward way or an unhealthy kind of change. Or we could say even you could change for the worse. But this is about change that is in process and in process of moving toward God's standard of holiness, and so it is definitely changing for the better. When you come across that language in the Bible, sanctification, I hope you can think of it in this way. It's God inviting me to change for the better. It's a good thing. It's built into our very development. We want to become better musicians, and better people. Do you want to know what God's will is for you? It is nothing less than radical changing for the better. It is not God's will that you become a Christian, even an ardent follower of Jesus, even what you could say is a true disciple, and then remain the same. No, God's will is your sanctification, that you begin the process of moving toward holiness, that you change for the better. And it is so important that the Apostle Paul mentions it here in this passage not once, not even twice, but three times. Here in verse 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Again in verse 4, that each of you know how to possess your own vessel in sanctification. And again in verse 7, for God has not called us for impurity, but in sanctification. <clears throat> However, and furthermore really, <clears throat> 
We cannot escape the clear teaching of the text here that at least in this particular instance, the Bible unequivocally associates such holiness with sexuality. Do you see that with me in verse 3? goes on to make clear, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, explanatory, conjunction, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. The phrase translated in your English Bible, and the version here, sexual immorality, is the Greek word porneos. Porneos, does it sound familiar? From which we get the word pornography. A misuse, an abuse of sexuality. And though this isn't my main concern, I just want to take a moment, a pause, and urge upon you in my experience, both as a pastor and even as a teacher of theology at a theological school, I've seen the destructive power of pornography in people's lives. How it rips relationships apart. I've seen marriages devastated because one partner is engaged in pornography. And I've seen people, unmarried, single people, who, to all appearances, it would just be hidden, but underneath they are shattered people because of the power of pornography. And even some of you here today may, young as you are, may be flirting with pornography. And I just want to say it is so destructive totally against the changing for the better sanctifying process of God. Just don't go there. Pornography becomes addictive. There's always more and more and more and more ugly examples <clears throat> of God's wonderful gift of sex. This phrase, porneos, which like its Levitical origin, the Le Levite's code, which I believe, even though it's quite hotly debated today, in my study of it, I can only offer you what I've concluded. Take it for what it's worth, maybe it will help you. But I personally am convinced it reflects the Jewish ethic at the time of the New Testament, the Jewish ethic that Jesus would have embraced and passed on even to the Apostle Paul, in which it is immoral, immorality, that is deterring from God's best or even an offense to God. Porneos, in the time of Jesus and in the early days of the New Testament, certainly in my opinion, Paul is using it this way, means to engage in any form of sexual practice that is outside the boundary, the gifted boundary called marriage between a man and a woman. Let me say that again because it's so important and so hotly contested today that porneos or sexual immorality, there are other terms in the Bible and other passages, but here this term, as I have studied it, is engaging in any form of sexual practice that is outside a wonderful boundary 
that God gives called marriage that means a marriage between a one man, one woman. And at the expense of being pedantic, I just want to be clear. That means it is suggesting, well, it's commanding, it's telling you God's best is not premarital sexual activity. It is not adulterous relationships even when you're married. It is not any form of bestiality. And it is not any expression of homosexual behavior, gay or lesbian. I have so many friends who struggle with homosexual tendencies, and I love them, and I welcome them, I embrace them, but I have to be honest with them. This is not, in my opinion, the Bible teaches it is not God's design. If you put it in a positive way, <clears throat> this is the statement we use in the church I now lead with Refugee people, we've had to talk about this area quite a bit because they're quite shocked when they end up in the West and all of its sexual openness and promiscuity that's very foreign in a, a Islamic state government where such things are punishable by execution. But this is how we put it. God created the sexual relationship as a gift. It's a beautiful gift from God to be enjoyed within the context of marriage between one man and one woman. Simple as that. Boundaried by God's control. I like to think of it as this boundary is the wonderful gift like a fireplace. A fire is a beautiful thing. We have a fireplace in our top floor flat in Glasgow and we are so happy <laughs> in the weather there. Fire all boundaried and contained and giving off beautiful uh, warmth and inviting people to gather around it. But outside that boundary it can become destructive. Even now, the fires in Canada raging out of control. It's not boundaried. Marriage is God's boundary. As you see, let me get rid of that. <laughs> Should have turned off the Wi Fi. As you see here, how the Bible quite clearly and explicitly also associates it as the measure of sanctification or moving toward holiness or what I am calling changing for the better. Perhaps, and I think it does, it entails many other things, but here perhaps because of its very public moral dimension, the Apostle Paul does not hesitate to make sexual fidelity, sexual faithfulness to God's way, the social bar by which being holy like God is holy is measured. And so I have to say as honestly as I can to you as young women, young men involved in Chamber Fest and this summer at the Chehi Summer School of Music, I have to tell you, I do think this is a big deal. It's not peripheral. Because the Bible here puts it in the strong language of the very will of God. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, abstain 
from sexual immorality. Here is the will of God for you and me and all who profess allegiance to Christ, that you meet Jesus in conversion, but you do not remain the same. You change. You begin the process of changing for the better, which means moving toward holiness or what is called here sanctification. And the strongest in what has become, in fact, a socio-political crucible, the strongest way that we demonstrate that very process that we are in, <clears throat> obviously ethical as well, is in, positively put, serious sexual fidelity that limits sexual practice to that which is boundaried by marriage between one man and one woman. The Bible says this is the will of God. And then do you see how the apostle puts it similarly, very briefly in reference to the call of God on your life? Read with me now as we finish verse 7. For God has not called us for impurity, but in sanctification. Paul's use of this particular term throughout his letters, the call of God, has both a collective sense, meaning called into the family of God via faith in Christ, and also the personal sense of God's specific ordained sense of purpose for you and me. What is your sense of calling? First into the family through conversion, secondly into a personal sense of his purpose for you. But here again, the demonstration of this, the way that is made public, both that you are a family member in the family of God and that you are living out God's purpose for you, in this text is none other than sexual fidelity in terms of living out God's best, or as it's put here in verse 7, negatively, you are not called or impurity, but in sanctification. This is God's will for you, changing for the better. This is God's call upon you, developing, growing, maturing, changing for the better. And they are both demonstrated in your obedience and mine in terms of the huge topic, the very hot topic today of sexuality, gender, orientations, transitioning, identity issues, all that goes with it. And dear young women, young men, I have to just tell you, I think this is a very big deal because it matters to God. This is the will of God. Your sanctification, that is, abstain from sexual immorality. This is a bit of a heavy teaching today. And I want to suggest that it is so personal, so full of gender and sexuality and identity questions, I know that. So rather than just preach it, I want to offer that it is better always to deal with it relationally, personally. I would offer myself to meet with any of you one-on-one -on -one or in a small group if you want to discuss it, ask questions. I'm sure many of you are wrestling with this either for yourself, but also you have friends who are challenging, you know, what is this all about? How can Christians hold to this standard? I would be so happy to talk about that today or tomorrow or Saturday. I'm here Sunday as well until 
I don't, I have a flight back to Scotland on Sunday evening. But I also want to offer the counseling staff. I'm not catching them off guards. We talked about this because this is huge and they're prepared if you want to meet with them and chat. Dr. White said this and that. Do you agree? Do you want to debate it? Do you want to have a one-on-one -on -one about that? See your counselors, please. Sometimes we're led to believe by even Christian leaders that really this is just a peripheral thing. It's not a big deal. I couldn't disagree more. When the Bible uses language, this is the will of God. It hardly could be stronger 